I originally started playing poker with a couple of my friends uh, back in like 2005. We got a $50 promotion from Absolute and never actually deposited. So in our minds, poker is just a big long free roll anyway. I remember back then one of the uh, epiphanies that we had was when my friend Nas came running to me like, hey man, I just read the super system and Doyle Brunson says, if you open, you need to just see bet for 100% of the pot. Um, so that's like one of the things that we lived by uh, starting out. And, you know, we basically just came up with a bunch of our own uh, strategies and we figured out what was working and scrapped the stuff that wasn't. Um, and eventually we started beating the small stakes. So I was kind of the six max games until I found out that uh, one of the biggest winners, if not the biggest winner at the time, uh, on full tail of the 510 games was it just lived right down the street from me. Uh, this was T-Doc 99. And I saw him out and decided that I would want to get coaching from him and potentially be staked by him. So eventually he staked me for the 200 down games on tape. And I think that's something that really propelled my career. And I didn't really look back after that. I basically started being the mid stakes six max games. And uh, right around 2008, I decided that I wanted to transition into Heads Up. Um, and Heads Up No Limit is my primary focus now. What would I attribute my success to? I think it's a combination of a few things, actually. Uh, both tangible and intangible. I did watch a ton of videos coming up. And I'm sure that's going to be reflected in my own videos here, but I think ultimately what's led me to be where I am now is the tight-knit group of close poker friends that I've been surrounded by and been able to keep. Um, I kind of think of them as teammates and everybody has been in it together since the start, so uh, it's definitely nice to have that support system uh, that you can lean on when things aren't going great, when you're in a downswing or whatnot. Nowadays I play Primarily high stakes has up no limit. Uh, I think my approach is unique in the sense that I tackle every poker situation from a very overall game plan perspective. I'm going to be making uh, multi table match videos that are very theory intensive, and I'm basically going to relay some of my some of the secrets to my success and things that I've learned along the way. I'm going to be reviewing a hand that I played during a four table match against WCG Rider on the Merge Network. Um, it was a pretty long match and it included a lot of different components and different adjustments. So I'll pretty much just specify them throughout the explanation as I deem them relevant. Um, but the hand in question is the top left table here with 8 9 off. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about preflop and kind of go through the hand street by street and explain my thought process. So I'm just going to roll the footage here. He opens the 3x and, and we call and he is opening 100% of buttons to 3x so I want to talk a little bit about our 3 bidding strategy here. Um, against a 3x open at 100 big blinds I would enjoy 3-betting this hand, but as we get deeper and approach the 200 BB mark, um, I prefer a flat for two main reasons, especially against competent, aggressive opponents. Firstly, uh, given our history and his 4-bet percentage of 17, we can pretty safely assume that he's going to be cognizant of how uh, stack leverage benefits him, especially if I'm 3-betting at a high frequency. Um, and on top of that, at 100 big blinds, his 4-betting strategy won't be as effective as when we're deeper because most of my pre-flop range is going to be either 5-bet shoving or just folding to his 4-bet. 
And this goes hand in hand with the second reason, which is that as we get deeper, I'll be forced to defend my three bets more. Um, and that's mostly going to be by implementing a balanced continuing range of uh, flatting four bets out of position as well as five betting both as a bluff and for value. So we decide to flat here and ravel C bets uh, two thirds pot. And I decide to check raise with my bare open ender. And the reason I'm check raising here is because I think on this dynamic of a board texture, when button C bets and big blind calls, his range is going to be a lot stronger. And for that reason, I expect him to be barreling a lot more on turns and rivers, uh, even more frequently than this turn C bet uh, stat of 66% indicates. So I kind of want to just take uh, take the aggressive route in this situation and uh, take the lead. And this strengthens my range. So we check raise and he calls and we turn straight on a three flush. Um, in this situation I need to be betting for value. Um, the reason for this is that I want to protect my wide range I'm going to have a wide range of semi-bluffing hands on this flop and I'll be betting all of those on the turn so I just need to get value out of my hand here from a lot of combos of ace x um, possibly 10x that bets the flop and especially those hands that include a spade so I want to size my bet relatively big here and this is going to be balanced with my bluffs and he makes an interesting play here on the turn We'll wait for it. He raises my turn bet here from 275 to 700. And what he's trying to tell me with this raise is that he has a flush. And the only thing he's representing by raising here, or trying to represent by raising here, is a flush. So our hand suddenly becomes a bluff catcher, um, and only a bluff catcher. And I just wanted to break down some ranges for both players, um, but more specifically the big blind in this situation. He has seen me check call the flop with nine out draws early in the match, and this is something I was doing because he was barreling tons of turns and rivers, and I kind of wanted to protect and strengthen my check calling range uh, on the flop and turn. Um, so, for that reason, um, I'm really only going to have my combo spade draws in his mind, and those hands would be 8-9 of spades, 10-8 of spades, jack-8 of spades, jack-9 of spades, and maybe jack-10 and queen-10 of spades, but I would likely be 3-betting a lot of those hands um, because he's opening 100% of buttons, and that would just be strictly for value. Um, so that really limits my combinations of possible flushes, whereas he can have all combos of spades. And I also can't have queen king, queen jack, and king jack of spades because those are all hands that I would three bet pre. Um, so, you know, up until this point, his logic is sound. And the crux of this hand really lies in his decision to raise the turn instead of calling. You know, for the same reasons that I need to bet 8 9 for value on this turn and flat some of my flush draws to strengthen my check calling range, he also needs to be slow playing his flushes in this spot um, for, to protect the, the weaker portions of his range. So he should also expect me to both bluff rivers and bet rivers thinly for value, um, and therefore wouldn't really raise a flush here and take the impetus back. So I was operating under the assumption that he wouldn't raise a flush on the turn, and for that reason I called. And ultimately, when you're operating under that assumption, um, we should be calling basically uh, a river shove with our entire flop check raise value range, the weakest part of which includes all three combos of 10-7 suited, um, even though that seems like a much weaker hand than an 8-9. So, just going to wait. Um, we check the river to him, 
and he shows here. And our decision to, as you can see, at a uh, queen king, but our decision to check call the river here in bluff catch becomes much easier, as you can tell by the speed of the river call when we're operating under the assumption that he cannot have a flush. So this is one of the more interesting hands that we played throughout our match, and I thought it would be interesting to review.